All right, we are doing a, another book review. Um, this is by Professor Michael Grosso on a guru of Indian raga music. Um, not a Brahmanada, Nanda. Nanda means bliss. Brahma means God. Nada means sacred sound. And I basically, I speed read the book. So I can't say I read it word for word. But I read a lot of it word for word. Um, Michael Grosso, I've read some of his other books. He has a lot of books that he's written. He has a doctorate in philosophy from Camp Columbia University, which is considered an Ivy League school. And I have corresponded with him mainly through his blog, posting comments on his blog. So this is his latest book, and it's just uh, basically like a memoir and he writes it in a prose style. It's so uh, very well written. Um, as usual, I, I really enjoy Michael Grosso's writing style. He's just, he's, you know, he, he writes like a, with literary flair. And it's about his time where he studied with, um, this reluctant monk um, in New York City in Greenwich Village from 1976 to 1979. And the monk was basically, he started out as a Raga master in India, and then he got fired, I guess, from like some court positions. And so then he apparently, my understanding is he moved to um, Rishikesh and he became a, a yoga monk based on his um, music training. And um, he did a discipline or what they call sadhana uh, training of 108 days in a dark uh, room, just drinking some milk each day. So it was a fast meditation fast for 108 days. And, and he, by doing that, he mastered um, what they call kum, um, kum, I'm gonna, I can't remember how to pronounce the word. It's like kumbacha, kumbacha. I'm getting it mixed up with that tea, with the um, kombucha tea. <laughs> but anyway, he could hold his breath for 20, 24 minutes or something like that. This is what um, Michael Grosso discusses how this monk was mentioned in a book on uh, yogis of India that came out in the 1960s and that they, that this guy um, was tested and proven to be able to hold his breath for over 20 minutes. And also they re actually recorded um, vibrations from out, from through his whole body And so here they're talking about the three gunas as the trident of Shiva. Um, so it's a, it's a fascinating book. Some of the stuff, you know, the stuff on like Sai Baba, I don't really agree with because Sai Baba has been, they talk about some other yogis like Sivananda, um, Sai Baba, um, but of course they don't mention, you know, that Sai Baba has been, got outed as a, um, predator. Um, 
but they do say that a lot of the sannyasin uh, sannyasins in India are fake. You know, the they say, oh, there's 12 million of them, but that there's no discipline and some of them are outright, you know, criminals and evil and and okay so at the end of the book he talks about what he calls transcendental music or celestial music and um now michael grosso he he relies a lot on plato and he he sort of he does the usual western thing where he conflates um pythagorean philosophy with platonic philosophy and of course he doesn't understand he, there's no discussion of music theory or the mathematics of music. And so the the three gunas are actually not platonic uh, philosophy. They're not platonic music theory. So that's where I disagree with the book. Um, but he, do, he does discuss um, abrupt global warming and just saying how you know, we are in apocalyptic times, and he just calls it the Kali Yuga, and he says how this, um, his teacher, Swami Nanda, Nada Brahmananda, argues that, you know, music is the best um, spiritual training for the for the Kali Yuga, because every, every human um, listens to music and likes music pretty much, you know, um, every human culture has music. Another thing is when he was tested, here it is. Scientists at of the University of Ottawa wired up not a Brahm, not a, what's his name? Not a Brahmananda. So they, that's when they, they also found out he did not have any REM sleep. His sleep was, now that, that's probably the most, like, the one little um, factoid of the book that stood out to me is that he was proven to not have REM sleep. Uh, if Now, when I read um, the memoir of H.W.L. Um, Punjaji, or um, Punja, the, um, uh, also known as Papaji, but he was a student of uh, Ramana Maharshi, or sorry, Rama... Um, Let's see. I get all these Indian. Which one is it? Rama, Ramana, Ma, Ma, yeah, Ramana Maharshi. Okay. Anyway, he also talked about how the um, yogis have a lot of deep, dreamless sleep, and that when Pundaji was a child, that he would have um, really deep sleep. Um, I don't know. I mean, I had that experience once where it's probably just a coincidence that like everybody else woke up from the fire alarm in, in my house, but I, I slept through it. It was probably just where my room was located or something. I don't know, but I think this, I can relate to the deep sleep thing, but, um, but his, um, Michael Grosso, he's trying to say that, well, the reason that, um, not a Brahmananda does not have, REM sleep is because when he's awake, he's in a REM dream like state while awake. Now that I thought that was a really uh, brilliant um, observation by Michael Grosso, because um, yeah, I mean the other comment that Michael Grosso makes is that um, not a Brahmanana basically does not have any repression. He has no psychological repression because as a yogi, you're experiencing what would normally be the subconscious. You're experiencing that as the super consciousness in real time uh, through the, um, the bio photons, you know, the, the aura, the holographic reality. And so that's why when you sleep, you don't actually um, you don't actually dream. You know, ideally, I mean, you would ideally you'd be in the fourth state of sleep. What in yoga philosophy um, is called uh, 
I'm forgetting my terms here. Start with the T. Um, Taria. Taria. Okay, so anyway, the what he does at the end, he talk when he's discussing celestial music, he talks about these Christian mystics that experience this um celestial music and that also people sometimes would hear the celestial music and um this is one of the most famous um near death experiences by uh Evan Alexander the neurosurgeon who focused on how this celestial music is what and it brought him back to life essentially but um he's kind of <clears throat> controversial because he had some he get people criticize people claim he's not the most honest person but i don't know he had some career uh problems with the sur surgery but the but um Michael Grosso, he cites um, D. Scott Rogo's book, which is on Nada, called Nod, after Sacred Sound. That's all about this celestial music phenomenon. And one of the things that um, D. Scott Rogo emphasizes is that the celestial music is natural um, tuning. He doesn't really call it tuning because he doesn't get into the whole music um, mathematics of the tuning, but he just documents how the the celestial music is either singing or um, like violins or, you know, instruments that have natural tuning instead of like the Western um, equal tempered tuning. So anyway, um, this is... It's a, you know, it's a really enjoyable book. Like I said, some parts of it I don't really agree with. But in terms of a Western perspective, he does a good job of getting into Western mysticism. Um, the... The uh, he also says uh, there was 150 testimonials of um, Saint Joseph de Copertino actually levitating because Michael Grosso was the author of the man who could fly about Saint Joseph de Copertino, who's the most well documented um, person to levitate. So those 150 testimonials, most of them were by people who were against um, St. Joseph de Copertino because <clears throat> the church didn't know what to do with them, with St. Joseph de But he also documents how St. Joseph de Copertino would levitate often from hearing hearing music. He would be inspired, you know, by the listening to music To Here we go. Um, a beautiful rendition of the hymn Ave Maria, Stella. Um, and then that triggered the levitation. <clears throat> and then right before um, St. Joseph de Copertino died, he talked about the songs he could hear, the celestial music you know, from the other side. And yeah, if you listen to the ND, the near death experience testimonials, they will often discuss this um, celestial music. Um, so the it's, yeah, it's a it's, it's a fascinating book, for sure. Um, the, basically, 
lot of it's like how um, the teachings of Nada Brahmananda, he was, you know, he was teaching Michael Grosso, but at the same time, he wasn't really understood in the West, so he didn't have the best uh, reception in the West. So part of the book is like, well, where is he going to stay? You know, what are we going to do with him kind of thing? <laughs> and then I think he says he died at 79 years old, but he never went to a doctor at all. And his whole point was, well, ever since he did that 108 days of fasting in the dark, that he basically transcended death at that time. And he wasn't afraid of death ever since then. And, um, yeah, they could record sound from his all parts of his body as part of the research on him. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's, a it's a great book, but part of it is basically like about how the yoga tradition it's kind of gotten lost in India, you know, the old school music, yoga connection, the training. And so this guy was a, was the real deal in terms of a music yogi. Here we go. Scientists at the University of Ottawa. Not one dream after three days, three nights. So it's it's fascinating that he was a music yogi. And <clears throat> the Here we go. The, the retreat, 108 days, special practice, not see the sun. Nada Kumbhaka. Nada Kumbhaka. So that's like sound, breathing as breath retention. And becomes a death body. So, um... So, this is, and of course, he wasn't in full lotus yoga, as far as I know. They would have probably mentioned that. <clears throat> oh, I guess he was making, <clears throat> he was making music, so that's how they knew he was still practicing. And then when he was done, they tested his body. And so the other thing is he, um, he has all these ragas memorized, um, the teacher. And basically his body you know, like became music. And then he does that Kumbhaka practice every day now. It took him seven years to master it, but now he does it every day. Of not breathing for like 25 minutes or something. Um, Actually, uh, Qigong master Jim Nance, he mentioned this in one of his uh, Qi talks about how uh, I think it was one of his brothers is a musician or something. And um, when he's around that person, 
his he'll experience like after he leaves the person he'll still experience the music that the person embodies that music and so they like become music you know their body is music and so that energy would then get experienced by Qigong Master Jim Nance, you know, after it would remain after the guy, after he was separated from his um, sibling. Um, they could still like hear, hear the music and experience it. And so there's this, this claim that, you know, music is the truth of re reality, that there's this, that listening has some kind of um, celestial, transcendental um, reality. And, and this is what I researched for the past uh, two years, is this what is called deep or um, primordial time, primitive time or um, fundamental time in physics is that this idea of time and frequency as music the being a law of phase harmony that is um, the foundation of reality. It's non-local non and um, proto-consciousness. And so it's accessed through uh, meditation. That's also a kind of alchemy training. And so this, this fellow... Um, embodied that teaching um, and so so it's a great book that um, Michael Grosso has written like I said you know parts of it I don't agree with that they're still too western in my view but that's again because um like he cites Alain Danilu, but if you study Alain Danilu, he he also is still too Western. The music theory is still too Western. But he cites cites uh, Jocelyn Godwin, but Jocelyn Godwin is still too Western. The music theory. So that was that was my whole point: is that um, unless you understand this, what's called non commutativity in music in uh, physics then you don't understand the secret of the three gunas of no guna, that um, Nada, <clears throat> Nada Brahmananda is discussing when he mentions the three gunas of, of Shiva being the no guna, that that is the... Um, okay, so it says here that um, Nada Brahmananda, he practices Nada Kumbhaka at 3 a.m. every morning while playing the tabla. So that's fascinating. So that must have been what he did in his training. He had the tabla that he practiced on. Um, another interesting thing about the hand rhythms is uh, one thing I have a video on this is that your left hand will keep a steady beat because the rhythm is directly wired to your cerebellum. So when you sing, it's the cross-wired, so your frequency is right brain dominant, but when you do rhythm, it's directly connected to the cerebellum that processes emotions. So the left hand will be the left brain instead of the right brain, and that's why the left hand keeps a steady steady um, rhythm when you do that. And that's discussed by Michael uh, Corbalis, the Australian um, neuro neurophysicist, or, or he was a he he passed on a few years ago, um, Michael Corbalis, but he he was like a studied um, the evolution of language with the using the hands, the gestures from um, primates. So this obviously this type of deep uh, physiological change is goes way back in our evolution. And that music was from before language. So there's this 
um, fascinating connection between rhythm and frequency, time and frequency and cross-wiring the brain that gets you into uh, non-locality, accessing this non-local reality. Um, and this is, of course, the training that I did to finish my master's degree as I tested out this, what I was calling sound current non-dualism uh, through the the 12 notes of the music scale as applied to the body, what's called the small universe meditation in um, Taoism, but it's also practiced in uh, Kriya Yoga. And I, I discuss this in my book, Ancient Advanced Acoustic Alchemy. That's a free book on uh, Doctroid or my academia website. And so anybody can get the... Um, music CD for the small universe meditation, and then they can do the same kind of training. But of course, um, it requires uh, purification as this Swami Nada did. You know, he fasted, basically fasted for 108 days while doing the music meditation the whole time and developed these... Um, psychic abilities and yoga um, abilities to hold his breath for 25 minutes, which were, would, the only way that could be done physiologically is through a very deep activation of the right side vagus nerve, um, which controls the lungs and also the heart. And so that means that he had transcended death through his um, yoga training because obviously a normal person would not be alive if they stopped breathing for 25 minutes. Um, and one of the things about the book is he focuses on the Nada um, Brahmananda. His, his mind is very focused and that that's the key of yoga is to have a, like a laser focused mind. And part of that is, you know, positive thinking. And that, and he says how mind control is, is life, you know, that that's the secret of being alive. Um, and so He's saying like how when Michael Grosso tried to do the training, his teacher would correct him. The harmonium and the... So the harmonium is actually, I think that was a French instrument that was introduced into India. So that's more like a Western instrument, but he also talks about, you know, ragas, which would be a traditional Indian. Um, so, Yeah, so here he's describing uh, somebody who f levitated, and as they levitated, they experienced this beautiful singing. Um, so, oh, that's from D. Scott Rogo's book. Yeah, I had that book, the Nada book. So anyway, this is the... Of course, you know, I could I'll, I could read the book word for word very slowly. That, and that, that's what I'll try to do eventually, savor the book. So thank you to Professor Michael Grosso for another awesome book.